And so it's my great pleasure to leave the floor to Daniela. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, well, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for the invite to this event. I'm very happy to be here on behalf of Adriana and the WHO and the team that works on medical devices and in vitro diagnostics. As they mentioned, I'm a biomedical engineer working now for a few years with WHO, and I'm happy to share with you some of the projects we're working on to increase access to medical devices. So first of all, let me go to the agenda. I basically will focus on three different projects. The first one is called the WHO Medical Devices Technical Series. The second one is a priority medical devices list and its associated database that it's called Medevis. And the third one is a compendium of innovative health technologies for those resource settings. So let me start saying that in order to have or to increase access for all populations, there are some must for health technologies. So health technologies must be safe. They must be of good quality, easy to use, easy to maintain, adaptable, affordable, available, accessible, and acceptable. So just, I want to start with that and getting that out of the way. Let me start with the first project I want to talk about. So this is called the WHO Medical Devices Technical Series. So the member states, which are all the countries that are part of the UN, have given the WHO a mandate to ensure improved access, quality, and use of medical technologies. And with that in mind, WHO developed the WHO Medical Devices Technical Series, which is a number of books and publications that cover areas in the technology cycle, from the development and design to the decommissioning of medical devices. So here is a graph of all the publications that we have and that we will have on this topic, on, on this series, and they are really color-coded. So the ones that, that are specific for research and development are more in red, regulation is green, management of medical technology is in blue, assessment and related to HTA in purple. Then we have overall publications, the Global Atlas of Medical Devices, that it's, it's really the status quo of medical devices worldwide. And it's published every four to five years. And it has a country profile for each member state. And it, it just gives a lot of information on how they're doing on medical devices and so on and so forth. Then we have this green book about the role of biomedical in the engineers as the workforce for medical devices and also one on creating policy for medical devices. So as you see, all the topics in the cycle of technology are covered and I would really encourage you to go to the website and look at these books. They will be very, very helpful. So with that in mind, I'll go to the next part or the next project I want to share with you. It's called, they are lists of priority medical devices, but we have two different kinds. So we have a specific one for in vitro diagnostics that it's called the WHO model list for in vitro diagnostics. And we also have priority medical devices list um, that really what these books try to do is to identify key medical devices uh, based, on in, in, based on their appropriateness and the use to prevent or treat specific diseases. So we have a cancer, a cancer book, um, chronic um, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and um, COVID book, but also the books can focus on specific populations of groups like newborns or maternal health. So here you can see the cover of the books. And what are these lists for? So these, these lists um, are used by member states, by institutions, by donors, and they can use them as a reference to develop 
or update their national list for procurement, reimbursement, or planning facilities. Or they can also use them to define which medical devices are required for, benefit, for specific benefit packages to expand universal cover, uh, universal healthcare coverage, or also to respond to outbreaks or emergencies, and in general to increase the well-being of the population. So these books are all available on the website, but we are now trying to move all the information, all the devices that are listed in these books towards an electronic database. So we've been working now for years in creating these two databases. One is called Medevis, that it's linked to all medical devices. And the other one, we call it for sure the EEDL, which is the electronic WHO and essential in vitro diagnostic lists. These two databases are now publicly available. Um, and I will share with you all the links at the end of the presentation. But basically, what we've been trying to do is collect all the information in all these books since the beginning, include, including the methodology and all the books uh, for the last 10 years, and have it in an easily accessible database. So why are we migrating to the database? Well, it really makes it easier to search a specific item since it allows to use filters. It also gives comprehensive and detailed information of each device. And the most important thing is that it can be easily updated. So instead of having to republish a book or rewrite a book, we can really update it almost in real time, which is um, um, an advantage, especially uh, to give accurate and updated information and guidelines. The, the Medevis also links each device with an intervention or with other medical devices. It would show link, give links to nomenclatures and other features like the technical specifications for some of the devices. All the information in these databases, it can be downloaded. And of course, it's all for free and available on our website. And the last thing I want to talk about today is the Compendium of Innovative Health Technologies for low resort settings. So these are again a series of books that really try to identify and showcase innovative technologies specifically for low resource settings. So these books focus on health technologies that have the potential to improve health outcomes and the quality of life and, and devices that really offer a solution to an unmet medical need especially in low resource settings. So when we talk about low resource settings, I want to share some pictures with you of, of some of the places that have used these technologies or that really have needed this technology. Here we see a picture of the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone in 2014 and 15. And of course the outbreak led to a, a lot of innovation that really need to be used in a very specific circumstance of um, a hemorrhagic fever in a tropical climate that really gave a lot of um, a born to new technologies because there were really very important needs that need to be met. PP was not meant to be used in tropical climate. So that was a very great challenge that led to new and innovative technologies. Here we also have a picture of a newborn or a baby getting oxygen therapy in Sudan. And this is a remote area that didn't have oxygen until they um, upscale or start using an uh, oxygen concentrator that was powered by a solar panel. And um, yeah, just keep in mind these, these settings here we see a district hospital in Jamaica that is really crowded, is short staffed, and, and meets many challenges every day. Uh, and yeah, here we also see a health post in the Solomon Islands and um, a maternal go on board in, in Ethiopia when we see mothers and newborns. And it's really important that we, we equip these health workers and we give access to these patients for technologies that will keep them 
uh, healthy and the babies and their families. So this is what the, the compendium really focuses on. So about the compendium, we have to date 262 technologies in all the versions of the compendium. The first edition was published in 2011. Uh, in 2014, it especially focused on PPE for the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And the last two editions, the 2021 and 2022, focus on innovative technologies for the COVID-19 response. We have planned a future call for 2023 that hopefully will open this year and it will be for non-communicable diseases or technologies to address non-communicable diseases. So how does it work? How does a compendium work? Well, in general, WHO opened a call and then everybody is welcome to submit the technology. So it can be innovators or, or the, the industry or research labs, they can really submit their innovation and the innovation can be either a mature product that is commercially available or could also be a prototype. Then there's an initial screen and um, WHO look at the submissions, that they are complete, that they are um, real. And we start then the assessment by putting together a committee of evaluators uh, of different disciplines that will evaluate different aspects of the technology or of all the technologies submitted. And then there is deliberation, so the whole committee would meet and they would discuss their, their evaluations and also decide if the, the innovation should be included or if there's more evidence need. And in the end, we have the selection. And then once all the technologies are selected for the compendium, then the new edition will be born. And of course, throughout the way, we have a lot of communication with the innovators where we ask for additional information or more evidence and we constantly communicate with them. So about the evaluation that we do for these technologies. So here we can see all the areas that are evaluated. They are really color coded. Uh, and then we see each specific domain. So first in dark red, we see the clinical intended use. Then in orange, the, techn the technical description and the functionality and operation of the devices, including the technical specifications. In green, all the regulatory approvals, pre and post market surveillance, and all the current evidence or information that they have in regulatory approval on any country. And then in purple, the health technology assessment and, and the evaluation of all the evidence that the innovator provided. In blue is the evaluation of the health technology management. And finally, in teal or green blue, it's the assessment of local production or potential local production and intellectual property. And here is an example of how the compendium looks. So each selected technology will have a, a complete profile. So first here we can see all the information provided by the innovator about the device and then the WHO assessment. We have the clinical assessment of the intended use. We also do a comparison of the technical specifications of the device compared to the ones produced by WHO. We have the regulatory assessment and the technology, the HDA and technology evidence evaluation. And in the third page, we can see the technology management the, and the local production and intellectual property evaluation. So this is really how the compendium looks for each technology. And here are examples of the last version of the compendium. So as you can see here, there are very diverse, diverse submissions of technologies. And in both the stages, commercially available and prototypes. So we have from masks to ventilators, um, health 
digital technology, other very innovative solutions, some that can be, that are really intended to be used in the resource settings. And um, the last thing I would like to talk is about the impact of this health technology in low resource setting. So we had the, long, the launch of the last compendium in June, and we really invited people to give us the testimony from the field. So I have three examples, one from Ethiopia, one from, from South Africa, and one from Myanmar, of how really on the impact, the real impact of these innovative technologies in low resource settings. So first of all was this neonatal CPAP that was used in Ethiopia. It's really an oxygen concentrator with a bubble driven CPAP machine, and it's intended to be used in neonatal intensive care units. This technology was published in the compendium in 2011 and 2014. And when we talked to the nurse on one of these hospitals in Ethiopia where it was being used, he really said that mortality of newborns with respiratory distress, distress syndrome was reduced along with the stay. So babies um, were having a shorter stay in the intensive care unit and we were having a better prognosis when using this device opposed to not using a device or using a device for adults in neonates. But they also share with us the challenges that remain. For example, they usually have lack of availability of trained personnel. So if there's a turnover, not everyone knows to use how to use this machine or this device. And they also have challenges accessing spare parts if it breaks down. They say the number of units they have compared to the number of patients they have, it's not enough and they also struggle with unreliable electricity supply. Uh, so this is the first example. The second example I want to share with you is about this Oxera mask in South Africa. So this Oxera mask is an oxygen accumulator with a PIP valve and it's intended to be used for hospitalized adult hypoxemic patients that require additional respiratory therapy from a PIP. This was published in the latest edition and was a very good resource for the COVID-19 response. So we talked with two doctors in South Africa in a very rural province that were using it to manage their oxygen supply. And a lot of the things that they told us is that this really is designed for their needs. It really elevated the oxygen shortage that was exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. So it has been extensively used in, in this rural uh, province in South Africa, and they really feel a gap in oxygen therapy. This device allows them to, to really preserve their oxygen supply without compromising the patient therapy, since it really prevents the draining of the oxygen supplies. And they also told us that beyond the COVID-19 response, it can be used during transport of patients, which can be very challenging when you are bringing a patient from a really remote lo location to a uh, referral hospital. The last example I have is this bedside newborn phototherapy that has been used in Myanmar, but it has also been used in many other countries. This is a phototherapy device with double-sided high-powered LED. It is designed to treat neonatal jaundice in rural settings, and it was published in the compendium in 2013. So talking with the users in Myanmar, which is the country with the highest incidence of neonatal jaundice in all Asia, they told us that after this device was introduced in many of the pediatric hospitals, the number of transfusions, exchange transfusions in infants went down to zero. Um, as I say, it has been used worldwide, so in over a thousand hospitals, and now they hit the milestone that they already treated one million babies worldwide. And another milestone that is also very important for us is that in 2021, it started local production in a low resource setting in Africa. So 
transferability and local production of technology is very important if we really want to increase access. So a technology that is easily produced where it is needed, it's really um, very important. Um, then talking about the impact of the devices, this is our last effort of the effort that we are having to try to assess retrospectively the real impact of the compendium. So we started this study where we want to look at both of the sides, the supply, the innovator, and also the demand. And we can we want we want to see how the compendium has increased the innovation and helped the innovators get the technologies where they want to get them, but also how it's been used in the low in the low resource settings, especially in LMICs. So we developed two electronic surveys that we shared in the last two months with our networks and with all the submissions of the compendium. And we are planning to conduct some interviews with key players. Um, and we are hoping to have some of these results and show further impact of this innovation in low resource settings. So I would really encourage you to go to the WHO website and see some of the projects we're doing. This is just an example of three projects, but there are many, there are lots of resources, lots of tools. And so I would encourage you to go to also visit both of the databases that are available. And yeah, maybe use the compendium as inspiration, really look at all the fields that we've been evaluating to really design and implement innovative technologies for the people that really need it. And I would like to close this talk just stating that innovative technologies really empower the healthcare worker to diagnose, monitor, and treat the patient. And I would say let's continue the efforts to increase access to populations everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniela, for this very interesting talk, which I hope was uh, of interest to our future innovators in this room and current students. So I really would leave the floor to them to see whether they have any question or curiosity or consideration they may like to share with Daniela. Do we have any question from the room? Are you too shy? If not, I can, I, I can certainly ask. Daniela, we have in this room well, about 100 uh, from here and remotely connected the PhD students. So uh, they are all, bi many are biomedical engineers. So they will be the future. They are the future innovators. While reviewing the proposals, okay, what it is the most common thing that, uh, in your opinion, innovators underestimate or do not consider when they refer to lower income countries? Thank you for this question. This is very interesting, but also very tricky. I think one of the things that happens, especially when the innovation doesn't come from a low resource setting, is that it doesn't have the implementation in mind. So a lot of the times the design really focus on the efficiency of the device, but sometimes excludes the implementation. So we can have a very sensible device that would detect very, very little differences in whatever it tends to measure, but it's not working if you have an electrical supply that has a lot peaks or if you have lots of blackouts, it doesn't come with a battery, it's not stored enough. If there's really a spike on the power, it would just melt down and die. And these kind of, of devices are really not, not friendly in these challenging, challenging settings that really require 
sturdy medical device. Maybe we don't have that much sensitivity in the measurement, but we can still give a good result to the patient without the device being so sensitive. Over. Thank, thank you, Daniela. Thank you. And this has been a strong message coming from several speakers. Now, also this morning, you heard from Ernesto this importance of being aware of the context, and many other speakers have been stressing this point, including, and Daniela, if you have any comment on that, uh, uh, the fact that uh, effectiveness, safety, clearly those are dimensions that WHO takes into account, but then there are many other dimensions regulatory status, health technology assessment, health technology management, which n normally, and that's not your fault, but when you are facing a PhD, you tend to underestimate. You think that the technical, the science is the thing where you have more fun, which is great. But then this is just one of the five parameters that Daniela shown. So Daniela, do you have any comment about that? Yes, I think sometimes also the very tricky part is a regulatory assessment because depending on when, where this technology is produced or where, it, where it's the intended market or so on, there are different regulatory requirements. And I think that as engineers, sometimes we're not very um, knowledgeable on all these requirements and and the regulations and then we really need to start informing ourselves of the different types of regulations and requirements that we will need to upscale our technology in multiple countries over. <laughs>